and introduce and say that Dr. Malowski is a medical oncologist and clinical and translational research researcher. His clinical interest is in the treatment of patients with genitourinary cancers, including bladder cancer, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, uh, and prostate cancer. He is the section chief of the Genitourinary Oncology Service and co-director of, Urolo of Urologic Oncology Program here at UNC. Dr. Malowski joined UNC to lead the Genitourinary Oncology Research Program with a focus on translational science and clinical trials in patients with urologic cancers. He, his research focuses on the development of novel therapies in patients with urologic malignancies. He has a particular interest in the design of clinical trials that utilize novel immunotherapies, as well as those that use the integrated genomics approach to characterize genitourinary cancers for, ge for genetic alterations that may represent targets for novel agents. Dr. Malowski, welcome. So glad to have you here today. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, and I want to begin by thanking the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network for the invitation to present today. Um, next slide. We're, we're thrilled to have you. And let, let me ask you, what's one thing that you might be able to tell us about yourself outside of your uh, professional bio there? Oh, sorry about that. Um, oh, no so, problem. <laughs> I, um, outside of my professional bio, uh, I love spending time with, uh, with my family. Uh, Tim and I, in fact, were just talking about uh, our uh, interest in uh, music and playing guitar uh, in particular. And so... Uh, I guess that, along with uh, reading non-medicine, uh, would be uh, would be three things that uh, that I do uh, to unwind and to uh, have fun outside of work. Great, thanks so much. So I mentioned poll everywhere; it's anonymous. We hope you'll all participate in this. Our first question is typically a softball. Uh, I don't think this is a big exception here. Which of the following is not a type of genitourinary cancer? A, prostate, B, bladder, C, rectal, or D, kidney? And that'll show up in Poll Everywhere in just a moment. And while you're uh, answering that, I'll say that this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William A. Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Matthew I. Malowski, MD, has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. All right, and Matt, we'll turn it over to you. Looks like we're uh, already, uh, I would say, maybe on the right track. Yeah, I think we're doing well so far. Uh, great. Um, so I think uh, we can probably move from here uh, right on to the next slide. Um, so again, it's a pleasure uh, to be here today. And thanks again to the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network and Tim and John for organizing uh, this event. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with, uh, with both of you. And so uh, I'm going to update you uh, on genitourinary oncology advances in uh, 2021. And I'll use as a framework uh, the uh, recent uh, genital urinary cancers uh, symposium uh, to discuss some of the exciting updates uh, that came out of that meeting. Next slide. And so these are uh, my disclosures, all related to institutional research funding. Next slide. And so again, we'll use the GU Cancer Symposium to highlight advances, and some of these related to antibody drug conjugates, uh, specifically in the management of urothelial carcinoma, uh, novel advances in radio uh, ligand therapy, uh, specifically with lutetium-177 PSMA in uh, prostate cancer, uh, adjuvant immunotherapy uh, in the treatment of patients with high-risk bladder cancer, as well as uh, many more. Next slide. And so we'll start with prostate cancer. And there's two studies that I'd like to focus on here. The first is the therapy uh, trial, or ANZEP-1603. Uh, this is lutetium-177, PSMA, which is prostate-specific membrane antigen uh, in metastatic castration-resistant uh, prostate cancer. And the second study is a study uh, referred to as the ACES uh, trial, looking at the combination of apalutamide and abiraterone uh, 
as compared to abiraterone alone in patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Next slide. So starting with the therapy study, uh, this is a very important uh, study looking at lutetium-177, PSMA-617 versus cabazitaxel chemotherapy, a standard of care in patients with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer progressing after docetaxel chemotherapy. And this uh, specifically uh, related to updated uh, survival, uh, that is progression-free survival and uh, patient-reported outcomes. Next slide. So this is uh, a schematic uh, as well as a uh, scan uh, looking at lutetium uh, PSMA-617. And so uh, lutetium-177 is a beta-emitting radionuclide uh, that can be used both for imaging dosimetry as well as for therapeutic uh, intent. And this is uh, simply <clears throat> demonstrating the way in which this works, targeting prostate-specific membrane antigen, which is expressed uh, on prostate cancer cells, uh, leading to cell death. And uh, one can see the changes in these PSMA-positive lesions uh, with uh, treatment with lutetium PSMA-617. Next slide. So this was the trial schema. So these were uh, patients uh, who underwent a gallium-68 PSMA uh, scan, as well as an FDG PET-CT. And patients were required to have PSMA expression um, and could not have FDG-positive PSMA-negative sites of disease. There were 200 patients that were random randomized on this study, one-to-one um, -to, -one to lutetium PSMA-617, um, or the standard of care cabazitaxel at 20 milligrams per meter squared IVQ3 weeks for up to 10 cycles. Next slide. So these again were the patient uh, characteristics. Remember previously treated uh, with docetaxel uh, chemotherapy. Uh, you can see the different the prior androgen receptor uh, directed therapies uh, that were utilized uh, in these patients and a uh, standard patient population with metastatic CRPC. Next slide. So again, the aim was to determine the activity and the safety of lutetium-177, PSMA-617 versus cabazitaxel with a primary endpoint of a PSA greater than or equal to 50% response. And here uh, you can see uh, that the PSA 50 response rate was greater at 66% as compared to 30 7% in the patients receiving cabazitaxel. Next slide. When looking at progression-free survival, uh, this is PSA and radiographic progression-free survival, the hazard ratio was 0 0.63, which was statistically significant favoring lutetium-617 as compared to cabazitaxel chemotherapy. And you can see here the patients without progression at 12 months were 3% in the cabazitaxel arm as compared to 19% in those receiving lutetium-177. You can see that these curves cross at about six months, and so there's no difference here with regard to the median progression-free survival. Next slide. Looking at objective uh, response rates, this is uh, per resist 1.1, again higher at 49% as compared to 24% in the cabazitaxel treated patients. Next slide. And looking at selected adverse events, there is a different spectrum of adverse events uh, looking at lutetium PSMA 617. Specifically, one can see thrombocytopenia, 11% grade 3-4. There is also dry mouth or xerostomia uh, related to the expression of PSMA in the salivary glands as well as uh, dry eyes. Uh, so sort of different toxicities uh, than traditional chemotherapy and of course chemotherapy being associated with uh, more uh, in the way of uh, myelosuppression with neutropenia as well as issues related to dyskesia and neuropathy. Next slide. So why is this an exciting uh, study representing a potential non-chemotherapeutic option for uh, patients with metastatic CRPC that has progressed uh, after uh, uh, AR-targeted therapy? 
there was a press release on March 23rd, uh, 2021, of a trial that many had been waiting to see the results of, the Phase Three Vision Study, which we should hear more about at the ASCO annual meeting. And the company announced positive results of the Phase Three Study with the radioligand therapy, lutetium-177, PSMA-617 in patients with advanced prostate cancer as compared to standard therapy. And uh, this also uh, suggested that the study met both primary endpoints, resulting in a significant improvement in overall survival, as well as radiographic progression-free survival in patients with PSMA-positive metastatic CRPC. So is this practice changing? Well, it likely will be practice changing uh, once uh, we see the data and if the data are consistent with the press release. Um, but certainly the therapy study points in the direction of this being an exciting advance in the management of patients with, uh, with metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Next slide. Moving on to the next study. Uh, this is the ACES trial. This was presented by Dr. Dana Rathkoff at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind phase three study of apalutamide, an AR-targeted agent, and apiraterone acetate plus prednisone versus apiraterone in patients with chemo-naive metastatic CRPC. Next slide. So this is the schema for the ACES study. This was a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind phase three study looking in patients with metastatic CRPC with progression on androgen deprivation therapy. They had progressive disease by standard criteria. The stratification factors for the study were the presence or absence of visceral metastases, the ECOG performance status, and the geographic region. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to APA plus abiraterone as compared to placebo plus abiraterone. And the primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival um, by investigator with a series of important secondary endpoints, including overall survival. Next slide. This is the pre-specified subgroup analysis of RPFS uh, for baseline characteristics. And you can see here that there is a suggestion of a, a more pronounced benefit perhaps in patients with visceral metastases as well as in patients greater than or equal to 75 years, favoring apalutamide and abiraterone as compared to abiraterone acetate, so two populations that uh, we would consider to often have uh, a more difficult time in terms of treatment uh, that may benefit with regard to RPFS uh, with the combination. Next slide. Looking at the long-term follow-up here, you can see a 30% reduction in the risk of radiographic progression or death. This is, again, the long-term results, RPFS analysis at a median follow-up of 54.8 months. And this, again, was investigator assessed. Here, the hazard ratio being 0 0.70, with a median PFS of 16.6 months for the combination versus 7.4 months plus for abiraterone plus, plus placebo. Next slide. Unfortunately, in spite of the significant RPFS uh, benefit associated for the combination, there was similar overall survival scene between apalutamide and abiraterone as compared to abiraterone alone with a hazard ratio of 0 0.95. And so again, here, no overall survival benefit was seen with the combination approach. Next slide. Looking at uh, safety issues uh, with uh, the combination as compared to abiraterone uh, alone, um, there are some uh, differences, as one can see uh, here, uh, some increase in grade 3, 4 hypertension. Uh, there is also uh, an increased rash, which is expected as a known side effect of uh, apalutamide, and uh, perhaps a slight increase in grade 3, 4 cardiac uh, events uh, as well. Uh, and fractures and osteoporosis with the combination. Next slide. 
So what were the conclusions of the investigators? Well, appropriately, it did meet its primary endpoint of RPFS as assessed by investigator in this chemotherapy-naive MCRPC population. Um, the extension of RPFS was uh, significant at six months in the primary per protocol analysis and 7.4 months in the updated analysis. Uh, and um, uh, this, although positive, uh, unfortunately did not translate to an improvement in overall survival. So I would say that the ACES trial is really not, not practice changing. Uh, we've had other studies that have also demonstrated that more is not necessarily better when combining uh, agents like either abiraterone and enzalutamide or here abiraterone and apalutamide. And so I would say without an improvement overall survival, uh, this uh, will not uh, impact or change practice. Populations such as those that are older than 75 or patients uh, with visceral metastatic disease. Again, uh, I think it's perhaps interesting to look at those in the context of future studies, um, but I don't think that uh, at this moment we are ready to uh, change practice. Next slide. So this is our first poll everywhere uh, slide, so I'll read the question. Uh, lutetium-177 PSMA therapy for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer is associated with which of the following toxicities? A, cardiotoxicity, B, renal dysfunction, C, xerostomia, D, pulmonary toxicity, or E, tinnitus. So again, as we use new therapies, uh, of course, we all learn this with immune checkpoint inhibitors. As one example, we need to all learn the new uh, spectrum of toxicities that are often quite different than conventional chemotherapy, and the same goes for this. And uh, the great majority got this correct uh, with uh, dry mouth or xerostomia being a side effect uh, based on uh, salivary gland expression, PSMA. Uh, next slide. So moving on to bladder cancer, there are three studies that I'd like to discuss. Um, the first one uh, was the EV301 uh, trial of enfortimapidotin versus chemotherapy in metastatic urothelial carcinoma that's been previously treated. The second is the EV201 study of enfortimapidotin in cisplatin unfit metastatic urothelial carcinoma patients that have previously received an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And then finally, the Checkmate 274 study of adjuvant and the volumab in high-risk muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. Next slide. So first, uh, I will discuss Dr. Powell's presentation, the primary results of the EV301 study, a phase three trial of enfortimapidotin versus chemotherapy in patients with previously treated locally advanced or metastatic urothelial carcinoma, a very important trial based on the initial accelerated approval of enfortimapidotin in patients with urothelial carcinoma who had progressed to after um, both immune checkpoint inhibition and chemotherapy as sort of the confirmatory uh, study Next slide. So infortimapidotin, again, is an antibody uh, drug conjugate. Uh, infortimap uh, targets uh, nectin-4, which is highly expressed on uh, urothelial carcinoma, and it is conjugated uh, to the uh, microtubule uh, disrupting agent, monomethyl or statin E, um, much like uh, the agent brentuximapidotin also uh, attached to monomethyl or statin E, therefore directly uh, delivering this uh, microtubule disrupting agent to the cancer cells. Next slide. So the EV301 study was an open-label phase three trial. Um, here, these are patients with metastatic urothelial carcinoma with radiographic progression or relapse during or after PD-1 or PDL one treatment for advanced urothelial carcinoma, as well as having received prior platinum-based chemotherapy. The patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to infortimab or pre-selected chemotherapy, and the options were docetaxel, paclitaxel, and influni, which is available in Europe but not in the States. Stratification variables were the ECOG performance status in the regions of uh, the U.S., as well as the presence or absence of liver metastases. 
The primary endpoint was overall uh, survival with a series of uh, secondary endpoints, as can be seen here, including PFS, disease control rate, overall response rate, and of course safety. Next slide. These are the demographics and the disease characteristics of the patients, uh, a typical uh, patient uh, population that is older with advanced urothelial cancer. Um, you can see here that uh, approximately a third of patients had evidence of liver uh, metastases. Um, the majority received one to two lines of uh, prior uh, systemic therapy and about 20% with a prior response to uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Next slide. This is uh, the important Kaplan-Meier curve demonstrating an improvement in overall survival uh, for infortimab as compared to uh, chemotherapy with a median survival of about 12.9 months versus 8.9 uh, months uh, for chemotherapy with a hazard ratio of 0 0.70 or a 30 percent uh, uh, proportional reduction in the risk of death associated with the use of infortimab pedotin that was highly statistically significant. Next slide. Looking at overall survival by subgroups, you can see here that uh, essentially all subgroups uh, benefit a uh, few uh, uh, that are characterized by lower numbers um, uh, are less clear, uh, but in general this therapy appears to work uh, well uh, for uh, almost all subgroups of patients. Next slide. Looking at progression-free survival, uh, again there is an improvement uh, in PFS, uh, median PFS of 5.55 uh, months for infortimab as compared to 3.7 uh, months for chemotherapy with a hazard ratio of 0 0.62. Again, highly significant. Next slide. An improvement as well, an investigator assessed overall response at about 41% uh, for the patients receiving infortimab and about 18% for those patients receiving uh, chemotherapy with about a 5% complete response rate. Uh, for patients are receiving infortimapidotin. And you can see the high disease control rate uh, for patients receiving infortimapidotin of close to 72%. Next slide. Treatment-related adverse events can be seen uh, here, and uh, infortimapidotin uh, is uh, reasonably well tolerated. Um, class effects, side effects uh, for infortimapidotin include uh, rash, um, as well as uh, others. Uh, that uh, include neuropathy. Uh, however, uh, you can see here the increased uh, rate of uh, toxicity such as uh, neutropenia, um, as well as uh, decreased in white blood cells, as well as febrile neutropenia associated with chemotherapy as compared to the antibody drug conjugate in Fortimab. Next slide. So conclusions uh, in Fortimab Adotin clearly uh, with overall survival, progression-free survival, response rate benefit uh, in patients uh, as compared to standard conventional chemotherapy in those who have previously been treated with platinum-based chemotherapy as well as immunotherapy, a tolerable and manageable safety profile, and it's the first drug beyond chemotherapy and immunotherapy to show a significant survival advantage in previously treated advanced UC in this randomized phase three clinical trial that was subsequently published in the New England Journal of Medicine and is certainly practice changing. Next slide. Dr. Bilar presented the EV201 study. This is in Fortimapidotin in cisplatin ineligible patients with locally advanced or metathetic urothelial cancer who received prior immunotherapy with a PD-1 or pd one inhibitor. Next slide. So this was a non-comparative pivotal phase two trial. Um, here, looking at cohort two, again, patients uh, previously treated with PD-1, pd one inhibitors, uh, platinum naive, cisplatin ineligible. Um, with a primary endpoint of confirmed overall response rate um, as determined by a blinded independent central review. Um, patients are treated uh, with infortimab, much like in the EV301 study, uh, with 1.25 milligrams per kilogram on days 1, 8, and 15 uh, for a 28-day cycle. Next slide. The key eligibility criteria, again, here were ineligible for cisplatin-containing chemotherapy and no prior exposure to platinum-containing chemotherapy in the locally advanced or metastatic setting, but previously treated with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibition. Next slide. 
These are the key demographic and disease characteristics of this population. And just uh, point your attention to the reasons for cisplatin eligibility here are quite clear with close to 70% of patients having impaired renal function uh, with a GFR uh, between uh, 30 and 60. Uh, about 24% of patients uh, with liver uh, metastases and about 43% of the patients with upper tract tumors. Um, you can see here that about 25% of the patients responded to PD-1, pd one containing therapy prior to receiving infortimab. Next slide. The confirmed overall response rate uh, was 52%, uh, which compares very favorably to historical controls uh, in this setting. Uh, the confirmed complete response rate at 20%, which is quite remarkable. Uh, and so this demonstrated uh, very promising activity in patients previously treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors who uh, were not candidates in general for platinum-based chemotherapy. Next slide. Looking at the change in tumor measurements, uh, here you can see that 88% of assessable patients uh, here um, uh, had uh, um, improvement uh, in uh, their uh, imaging uh, findings from baseline. Next slide. Here, looking at responses uh, by subgroup, again, uh, by blinded independent central review, you can see the responses were observed across all subgroups. Um, with primary tumor sites in the upper tract, the response rate was 61 percent. With liver metastases, 48 percent. In patients who did not respond to uh, prior PD-1, pd one inhibitors, the overall response rate was 48%. So again, very, very promising uh, in often uh, patients who otherwise uh, would do poorly uh, with subsequent therapies. Next uh, slide. Promising progression-free survival at uh, 5.8 months median survival. And uh, again, uh, promising uh, overall uh, survival, looking at uh, median at 14.7 months with a median follow-up of close to 13 months. Next slide. So uh, cohort two, uh, what are the conclusions here? Uh, so the response rates uh, are numerically high, uh, uh, the highest observed for any regimen in cisplatin eligible patients, 52% uh, overall response rate, again, with a 20% complete response rate, 10.9-month uh, median duration of response, uh, promising progression-free as well as overall uh, median overall survival. And so I would say uh, with regard to the use of infortimab pedotin in patients uh, who are cisplatin ineligible, previously retreated with PD-1, PD-L1 uh, therapy, um, this is uh, certainly promising, um, but not practice changing at this time. I will also just add that the landscape has changed uh, with the Javelin 100 bladder uh, data pointing to the use of chemotherapy, either uh, cisplatin or carboplatin-based chemotherapy, uh, followed by switch maintenance uh, immunotherapy with ibuvimab, and so less in the way of uh, PD-1, uh, PD-L1 therapy in cisplatin-eligible individuals up front. And in fact, ODAC is currently reviewing that data um, because the initial approvals uh, uh, were accelerated, and uh, there have been subsequent studies which have not pointed to uh, the sort of benefits that were initially seen uh, within the smaller studies. Next slide. The Checkmate 274 uh, trial is an exciting adjuvant uh, study for patients uh, with bladder cancer. Adjuvant chemotherapy in bladder cancer is used but does not have uh, as high a level of evidence as uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, which has been demonstrated to improve overall survival uh, in large randomized phase three clinical trials. In addition, uh, not all patients uh, are candidates for adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So this was a phase three randomized double-blind multicenter study of adjuvant nivolumab, an anti-PD-1 agent versus placebo in patients with high-risk muscle invasive urothelial cancer. 709 patients, and the inclusion criteria included patients with T2 to T4A or node positive disease who had previously received neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy, as well as patients with PT3 P to PT4A or node positive disease who had not received prior new adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy and not eligible or refused adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. The stratification factors here were PDL1 status, uh, prior neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy and nodal status, 
and patients were randomized one-to-one to, -one to nivolumab every two weeks versus placebo every two weeks for treatment up to one year. The primary endpoint was disease-free survival in the ITT population and disease-free survival in all randomized patients with tumor pd one expression greater than or equal to 1%. And here we know that pd one is often measured by different immunohistochemical assays. This was looking specifically in tumor cells or tumor cell membrane staining in at least 100 tumor cells using the pdl one ihc 288 form dx assay. There were a series of important secondary uh, endpoints, including non-urothelial tract recurrence-free survival, disease-specific survival, as well as overall survival, as well as a series of exploratory endpoints looking at safety and health-related quality of life. Next slide. So again, the two primary objectives were DFS in the randomized ITT population, as well as in those patients randomized with pd one greater than or equal to 1%, and the sample size calculation uh, was approximately 700 patients. Next slide. Looking at the select baseline demographic and disease characteristics in all randomized patients, here uh, you can see that uh, approximately 20% of patients by design had upper tract disease. Uh, approximately 40% uh, of patients uh, had PD-L1 uh, greater than equal to 1%, and uh, about 44% uh, of patients had previously received neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Next slide. These are the Kaplan-Meier curves looking at disease-free survival, and here you can see a very significant improvement in DFS, both in the ITT population, median uh, DFS of 21 versus 10.9 months for nivolumab as compared to placebo with a hazard ratio of 0 0.70. And perhaps uh, an even uh, better signal with regard to DFS uh, in the pd one greater than 1% uh, population that is using a biomarker um, with a median DFS that was not reached with nivolumab as compared to 10.8 months with placebo with a hazard ratio of 0 0.53. Next slide. Looking at non-urothelial tract recurrence-free survival, these are typically the type of recurrence events that we care most about. Out, those recurring outside of the um, urothelial uh, tract, um, these type of incurable recurrences, uh, and improvement here in the ITT, as well as uh, a greater improvement seen with a hazard ratio of 0 0.54 in the biomarker selected PDL1 greater than to 1% population. Next slide. <laughs> Here, uh, another uh, secondary endpoint of distant metastases, uh, free survival, uh, again, improved in both the ITT at 0 0.60 in the biomarker selected population. Next slide. Looking at the safety summary in all uh, treated uh, patients, um, here you can see that any cause AEs uh, close to, you know, 95 plus percent of patients, about 42 uh, percent of patients greater than equal to three with nivolumab as compared to 36.8 percent with placebo. Um, you can see that slightly higher in the treatment-related AEs uh, for nivolumab as compared to placebo. But I think that you know, this is really interesting data because it points to how well um, tolerated overall um, these uh, agents are, that is, these new immune checkpoint inhibitors, particularly used as monotherapy. If you look at the sort of grade, grade than equal to three toxicities that are very comparable for placebo as compared to nivolumab. So I think very, very interesting and informative. Of course, we're all familiar with uh, when things do in fact go wrong with immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, but for the great majority of patients, tolerability is excellent. Next slide. And here is the health-related quality of life data, uh, looking at a global health uh, status score, uh, demonstrating uh, no deterioration in health-related quality of life with nivolumab versus placebo uh, in either the ITT or in the biomarker-selected populations. Next slide. So, summary of this uh, data by the authors, um, adjuvant NEVO, uh, as we reviewed, significantly improved uh, the primary endpoint of disease-free survival.
in patients with high-risk uh, muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma after radical surgery, both in the ITT and PDL one greater than or equal to 1% populations. We looked at non-urothelial tract recurrence-free survival, distant metastases-free survival, um, but it's early uh, to be able to look at overall survival. And so we don't have uh, the answer to whether or not this DFS benefit ultimately will translate uh, to an improvement in overall survival, whether that will translate uh, both in the ITT population um, or simply in the biomarker selected greater than or equal to 1% PDO1 positive population. And so that's going to be important information to have down the road. Um, I certainly think this has the potential to be practice changing. Uh, with really out the ability to pursue adjuvant therapy in many patients with high-risk muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. However, with some caveats, next slide. The INVIGOR-10 study uh, that was presented by Dr. Hussain uh, was a study similarly designed uh, looking at adjuvant uh, atezolizumab in a similar high-risk population. Uh, here, an anti pd one agent uh, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to observation, so different. There was no placebo control here. And uh, here, the uh, uh, follow-up was uh, for a primary endpoint, so disease-free survival, looking in the ITT population uh, with a uh, key secondary endpoint of overall survival and exploratory analyses, including uh, looking at pd one status. Next slide. Unfortunately, this uh, was a negative study. Um, this did not show a benefit with regard to DFS in the ITT population, as you can see here, with the DFS hazard ratio of 0 0.89 that was not significant, uh, median DFS of 19.4 uh, versus 16.6 .6 months. Next slide. Uh, there was uh, not a benefit uh, seen in either the PDL1 uh, low or PDL1 high. Uh, populations. You can see the hazard ratios here. Next slide. And so we have one positive uh, study for DFS, the Checkmate 274, a negative study, the Invigor uh, 10, and there is an ongoing study uh, which we have open accruing at UNC after having participated in the Checkmate 274 study, the Alliance 031501, led by uh, a colleague, Dr. Andrea Paolo, who is at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, this is, again, being performed through the NCI-NCTN uh, Cooperative Group Mechanism through Alliance. And this is looking at adjuvant uh, pembrolizumab, an anti-PD-1 in muscle invasive and locally advanced urothelial carcinoma, otherwise referred to as the ambassador study. Here, uh, patients are randomized to pembrolizumab uh, as compared to observation. So again, no placebo control. There are co-primary endpoints here of overall survival and disease-free survival. So this will be a very important study uh, to follow as we uh, watch the Checkmate 274 data mature uh, and determine whether or not there is a definitive role for the use of adjuvant immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy uh, in the management of patients with high-risk muscle invasive urothelial carcinoma. Next slide. So our next uh, polling question in fortimapidotin is associated with an overall survival benefit as compared to standard chemotherapy in patients who have received the following treatment. Platinum-based chemotherapy only, immunotherapy only, FGFR targeted therapy only, platinum-based chemotherapy and immunotherapy, immunotherapy and FGFR targeted therapy. And everyone is correct. The indication here from ED301 is prior platinum-based chemotherapy and immunotherapy. Next slide. So moving on to kidney cancer, where we'll end, uh, I'll talk about two important studies. One is the CLEAR study looking at linvatinib and pembrolizumab in advanced clear cell renal cell carcinoma, as well as the very interesting SWOT 1500 trial um, demonstrating a benefit for cabozantinib in patients with papillary renal cell cancer. Next slide. So the CLEAR study was a phase three trial that was presented by Dr. Mozart at Memorial Sloan Kettering looking at linvatinib plus pembrolizumab or verilimus versus sinidinib monotherapy as a first-line treatment for patients with advanced uh, renal cell carcinoma. Next slide. This was the study design, again, advanced clear cell RCC, treatment naive, measurable disease and adequate organ function with stratification factors of geographic region and MSKCC risk category randomized in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one fashion to linvatinib and pembrolizumab, linvatinib or verilimus, or sinidinib with a primary endpoint of PFS by IRC 
per resist version 1.1 and a series of important secondary endpoints including survival, response rate, safety, and health related quality of life as well as important exploratory analyses. Next slide. These are the baseline characteristics of the patients treated on the trial and you can see that the majority had intermediate risk disease by the international uh, uh, database consortium RCC risk group uh, classification. Um, about 30% of the patients had favorable risk disease with a minority having poor risk disease. Uh, approximately somewhere between about uh, 6 uh, to 8% of patients had sarcomatoid features and you can see the breakdown of pd one uh, expression here with about uh, a third of patients uh, uh, in the categories of greater than or equal to 1, less than 1 and not available and the majority had prior nephrectomies. Next slide. Here um, you can see a significant improvement uh, in progression-free survival with lenvatinib and pembrolizumab as compared to sunitinib with a hazard ratio of 0 0.39 that was highly significant, as well as an improvement in PDFS with lenvatinib and virulimus as compared to sunitinib with a hazard ratio of 0 0.65, and a median PFS of about 24 months with lenpembro, 14.7 with lenavirulimus, then 9.2 with sunitinib. Next slide. Again, the progression-free survival uh, benefit with lenvatinib plus uh, pembrolizumab was seen across all key subgroups. Next slide. And here you can see uh, an overall survival uh, benefit associated with lenpembro uh, uh, versus uh, sunitinib with a hazard ratio of 0 0.66. And although a PFS benefit was seen uh, with lenavirolimus, this did not translate to an improvement in overall survival as compared to sunitinib. Next slide. Confirmed objective response rates uh, were high with uh, lenv uh, pembro, uh, 71%, with a CR rate of 16%, 53% with a CR rate of about 10%, uh, and 36% uh, uh, with a CR rate of 4.2%. And really the response rate, uh, 71% versus uh, with a CR rate of 16%, is really the highest we've seen uh, with combination uh, uh, TKI immunotherapy in patients with uh, advanced clear cell RCC. Next slide. It's important to understand that there are a lot uh, of uh, side effects that can be associated with these therapies that lead to the requirement for dose modification. Uh, and here you can see uh, that close to 70% of the patients required dose reductions of uh, lenvatinib, um, both uh, in combination with pembrolizumab and virulimus. Next slide. So here, an improvement in PFS, overall survival response rate for Len Pembro and Len Verulimus with the PFS benefit and overall response benefit, but not overall survival benefit. I think this is certainly practice changing as another uh, immuno-oncology agent plus VEGFR TKI uh, combination therapy in patients with advanced clear cell carcinoma in the first line setting. Next slide. And this shows that we have uh, many first-line options for patients with metastatic clear cell RCC, including um, data with immuno-oncology agents, uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab in combination, uh, pembrolizumab and axidinib, nivolumab and cabostanzinib, and now uh, the potential to use pembrolizumab and lindatinib. Next slide. And finally, I'll just touch briefly on the SWOG 1500 study, which was a phase two randomized study uh, looking at sunitinib versus cabozantinib, crizotinib, or savalidinib in metastatic papillary RCC. Next slide. Um, these, uh, again, were pathologically verified, uh, verified centrally. Um, and that's important uh, for uh, these subtypes of uh, renal cell carcinoma up to one or prior systemic therapy uh, with an adequate organ uh, function and performance status. Next slide. So here uh, is the schema and uh, you can see here that the sabalitinib and crizotinib arms were closed for futility in December of 2018. All of these uh, target the med proto oncogene uh, and uh, that's uh, an important uh, player in the papillary RCC. And so the primary endpoint here was progression free survival, looking at sunitinib versus capacitive. Next slide. And there was a significant improvement in progression free survival with um, uh, capacitive as compared to sunitinib at nine months versus uh, 5.6 months. Next slide. <clears throat> 
It was also uh, an improvement in response rates, uh, as you can see uh, here, with a 23% uh, response rate uh, with cabozantinib uh, <clears throat> as compared to a 4% response rate with sinitinib. Next slide. So what do we conclude from this? It's really the first randomized trial exclusively in patients with metastatic papillary RCC to complete accrual. And uh, congratulations to Dr. Monty Paul uh, from City of Hope, who uh, was the PI for this study through the Southwest Oncology Group, again, NCIA. NCTN uh, trial, improvement in progression free survival meeting the primary endpoint with a hazard ratio of 0 0.60. And so certainly practice changing is a new standard for papillary renal cell carcinoma. Uh, however, um, you know, I think that uh, this really only sets the stage as a comparator for future studies uh, and certainly more work to be done. But again, congratulations uh, to the authors for a difficult study to perform. Next slide. And so our last polling question, the combination of pembrolizumab and lenvatinib in the treatment of metastatic clear cell RCC is associated with free, frequent dose reductions for which agent? Um, a is uh, pembrolizumab, B lenvatinib, C both, D neither. And I apologize, it looked like we were having a little trouble with our Poll Everywhere slide activation. It should be activated now. It looks like there still may be a little bit of trouble. Um, I think so. If you want to go having... ahead and let them know the answer and <laughs> yeah. in the interest of time, we'll go Absolutely. ahead and, and yeah. move forward. Absolutely. I'm sure that uh, everyone does know the answer. I mean, we don't really dose-reduced pembrolizumab, so the answer was levatinib. It was dose-reduced in approximately 70%, both in the lymphatinib pembrolizumab and the lymphatinib uh, virulimus arms. Uh, next slide. So with that, um, I think that uh, some really exciting uh, advances uh, for uh, prostate, bladder, and uh, uh, kidney cancer uh, came out of the ASCO um, Genital Urinary Cancer Symposium 2021. And uh, with that, uh, I will end, and I'm more than happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Dr. Malowski, that's a tremendous amount of information. Thank you so much for, for that really valuable presentation. Uh, hopefully, our poll everywhere is working. I'll be watching for questions. I, if I don't see any show up in the next uh, 60 seconds or so, uh, we'll have you try submitting those in the chat as well. Uh, or or if, if, again, if you're having any trouble, oh, no, that, that does seem to be working now. So go, let me go ahead and pop the first one up. With so many first-line options for RCC, how do you choose? Yeah, I thought you were all going to tell me what to do. Um, I think that, you know, it's exciting that we have all these options. And I think the answer is that all of these represent excellent options for patients. Of course, you know, the... Nivolumab, bipolumumab combination from Checkmate 214 is specific for patients with intermediate porous disease. And uh, we don't yet have um, the lenvatinib pembrolizumab uh, approved as of yet. Um, but I think that uh, it is really a matter of um, using uh, these agents, uh, selecting patients based on coexisting uh, medical issues, particularly when we're talking about IOIO versus IO VEGFRTKI, as I think we all do standardly in practice. But in terms of um, using one IO VEGFRTKI regimen over another, I think it's really hard uh, to tell uh, people what to do. I think that it's important to become comfortable um, with these regimens. And uh, I think what practitioners will likely do is uh, become comfortable and begin to use those regimens. Certainly the clear data is exciting with regard to the response rates, um, but uh, again, I think that it's very hard to compare one trial to the next trial, and I think um, really it represents a tremendous advance for our patients, and uh, practitioners will uh, become comfortable with different uh, regimens, and I think it's fine to use any of these regimens in appropriately selected patients. Next uh, right. question. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead and go to the next. And hopefully, uh, I, th I think everything's working with our Q&A. But if you do run into any problems with that, just go ahead and, and share those in the chat, please.
All right. So for the therapy trial, do we know how many uh, median cycles of Kabazi patients were able to take, uh, given yeah. that they were allowed? I'll let you go ahead and take the rest of it there. Yeah. So, um, so that's an excellent question with regard to the median number of cycles that the patients uh, were able to take on the SWAT 1500 study. Um, you know, I think this is really just alluding to a really important point that uh, cabozantinib is, in fact, not um, always an easy drug um, to give and uh, often will require um, frequent uh, dose uh, reduction or dose modification. Um, I don't recall, uh, although it's certainly possible that that data was uh, presented, um, but I don't recall the median number of cycles that were administered uh, in, um, in Dr. Paul's presentation, um, but the data has been published, so I'm certain that it's available, um, but I apologize. I don't have that at my fingertips right now. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much for that question. Then we just had a clarification on the, the um, medication name. I am not seeing any more questions. I'm going to go forward and uh, look at our thank yous and, and do, do a few wrap-up things, and then I'll come back to our questions and poll everywhere at the end, just in case anyone has, uh, we, we might have time for one or two more at the end if you would like to submit those while we're going through the, the next items. Um, I do want to say a, a tremendous thank you to uh, the citizens of North Carolina for their generous support uh, of the University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Cancer Center. We want to thank our team, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, John Powell, Aaron Schmidt, for all the hard work that they do.